with Mile High Hoops podcast. As always, I am your host, Zach Bai, and as always, I appreciate you spending a sliver of your busy day with me here on the pod, reacting to an entire Denver Nuggets season. Mercifully, the regular season has come to an end. You made it through the marathon that is the 82-game construct of the National Basketball Association, and now a new race starts. Um, before we start, um, we're going to do, let's, let, let's talk about just the, the structure we're going to handle today's show, um, with, so we're going to react to what we saw over the weekend as maddening as it was. We're going to look at the overarching nuggets season. And then, uh, right now at the time of recording, it's Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and in a few hours from now, we're going to know who the nuggets first round opponent is the winner between the Pelicans and the Lakers. And, when we'll come back on Thursday as we've been recording all season long on Tuesdays and Thursdays and we'll react to the opponent and give a full preview of what the first round is going to look like beginning on Saturday. I believe the time slot is going to be six o'clock here mountain time. I believe don't hold me to that um, with Phoenix and Minnesota doing the late night um, uh, duties. We'll see actually how that uh, develops. Um, and we'll know, obviously, by Thursday. And then we'll just wait to react to Because I don't want to get too carried away with doing Pelicans, Lakers. And by the time you hear this um, or watch this, it, we, we may already know uh, the outcome. So we'll, that, that'll be the construct of it. Real quick, uh, we cannot move forward, even though it was a couple days ago, without addressing what happened on Friday evening. Um, guys, I mean, we came in here on Thursday reacting to the biggest win of the season to secure, to secure the number one seed in the Western Conference and home uh, 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 home court advantage throughout the Western Conference playoffs. And I, I I almost even sitting here on a Tuesday cannot believe what happened on Friday night. I mean, I, th- there's first of all, I just assumed, I think I mentioned this on the pod, that we weren't going to see Wemby. We did not see Wemby in the game before uh, that San Antonio played, and they shut him down for the last game of the season. And they clearly don't win that game without him. But um, it goes back to you, you, you grow up playing youth sports and you'll hear coaches tell you hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And the Denver Nuggets uh, kind of it felt like a, uh, a senior who passed the final exam. And in order to end up a uh, finish the season on honor roll. Uh, the biggest test was the exam, but then he needed to come to school for two more days. And just, and just be physically present at school for two more days, check the attendance box, and boom, you're on high honor roll. And that's what it felt like. The Nuggets passed the final exam against Minnesota and just had to show up and complete the day at school, check the attendance box, be competitively present, and you are going to finish with the one seed. And in the second half of that game against San Antonio, that's um, that that unraveled right before our eyes. And I just, again, I still can't even believe that it happened. And, and I don't think it's the biggest deal in the world. And I, we'll talk about why in a second. But um, losing 34 to 20 in the final uh, a quarter, they lost by 14 points to a 20 win team over the course of 12 minutes. That's hard to do. And, you know, you have an 18-point lead at half. I think it was. The largest lead was 23. You just needed to show up to school with a competitive spirit, and they weren't able to do it. And next thing you know, you have, you know, Devontae Graham, uh, who I haven't thought of since he was a Jayhawk, uh, winning a game for the, the the Spurs, 121 to 120 at the buzzer. And it was just one of these things like, holy crap, I cannot believe that just happened because it wasn't just, it wasn't just the one seed. You came all that way with this marathon, all right, there's there's two percent in the race left, and you have a ch- chance to set a a PR, right? Track people are into the PR, right? Personal record. This had a chance to be the most wins in the history of the Nuggets, and now it just is tied with it. I mean, that's just a layer of storytelling that doesn't get to be told because they didn't finish the season the right way. That being said, because of what happened the next day uh, or Sunday, I think it was. Um, or whatever it was, the the Minnesota Timberwolves losing to Phoenix, and they have been owned by Phoenix here, all right? Minnesota losing to Phoenix was, I thought, the biggest win of the season that the Nuggets weren't a part of. They, they Just on their couch, that happening, and then them being slotted in the two seed instead of the three seed, I think is a huge deal. 
because now you're not going on the road to start a series until the Western Conference Finals, and that's assuming if Oklahoma City's uh, uh, the the Thunder win their first and second round series. They've won a combined zero series together, this group, this iteration of, of the Oklahoma City Thunder. So they have to do what they haven't done together twice for this to be relevant. And do I think that Oklahoma City uh, uh, could win back-to-back games in, uh, against Denver at home? No, I don't. I think Denver would steal one. So then the only the only way that it would truly come into play is if there's a Game 7 for the young, second youngest team in the NBA playing the champions. I, I, just, I just don't... I wanted it for Denver. I wanted it for the fans. I wanted it for the win record. I wanted it for the unequivocal number one seed and the statement that that just is. Um, but from a true, like, utilitarian outlook at it, just actually, what, like, what does it actually mean? Forget the narratives. Forget the win record. Forget the emotion of the loss. What does it actually mean, and where could it actually come into play? That's what I mean, like, from a purely utilitarian on paper, what does it mean? It doesn't actually mean a whole lot. So um, it is what it is. Nuggets are the two seed. I think it's fine. It really, once you get out of your feelings of how it fell, which sucked, let's just own that, um, it's not that big of a deal. So, uh, I, and I don't think it's going to have any relevance um, in, in these playoffs. Um, all right, that's in the rear view. Uh, I want to talk about big picture, uh, the Nuggets season as a whole. Um, right now, at the time of recording, MVP votes are rolling in. Let's just start with the Joker, the head of the snake. It's only right. Um, at Right now, at the time of recording, we have 17 um, known ballots that the voters have made their followers on Twitter aware who they voted for. Stephen A. has made his audience on TV aware of who he voted for. Uh, 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 you know, Chris Broussard has went on TV. So that's how we know right now, and we're gathering them. And uh, among the 17 votes, again, at the time of recording, that we know, 14 of the 17 votes that we know of have voted for Jokic first place. This matches up with the last iteration of the straw poll from Tim Bontemps at ESPN. It, Jokic is going to be the ninth player in the history of NBA basketball to win uh, three MVPs. And he deserves it. We've been talking about it for months um, now, that's not to say that there wasn't other deserving guys. I mean, Shea Gildress Alexander is is a deserving candidate. He he really is. When you're talking about scoring 30 points or more, more than 50 times, and being like and doing it for the one seat. Now he's not the leading scorer in the NBA, and he's not the second leading scorer. He's the third leading scorer in the NBA after Luka and Giannis. There's a case to be made for Shea Gildress Alexander. Make no mistake, and people will vote him number one. All right. There's a case to be made for Luka Doncic um, to be the MVP of the league. He's the leading scorer in the NBA by a couple buckets over SGA, by the way. Um, he has a great case for MVP. But when it's all said and done, when you're talking about being a top 10 scorer, Jokic is. A top 5 assister, Jokic is. Top 5 rebounder, Jokic is. Guys, Look at steals. Literally, look at steals. Nikola Jokic is 13th in the NBA. Or excuse me, excuse me, he's not 13th. He's tied for 7th in steals with Herb Jones, Fred Van Vliet, Dyson Daniels, Jalen Suggs, Luka Doncic, and Nikola Jokic average the same amount of steals from a center spot. DeJounte Murray, they're all tied for 7th in the NBA. In steals, so your top ten in points, top five in rebounds, top uh, five in assists, and and top se- top seven tied for seventh in in steals, and then you go into the event. That, that's just the raw numbers. The raw numbers say it. The advanced numbers scream it, right? So um, I think Jokic is it's actually going to be a landslide. Had the Nuggets finished with the one seed. I thought it would have been even more glaring and would have broken even more ties. Because Oklahoma City is the one seed, I think it could break ties with people who feel more comfortable voting for one of the NBA's leading scorers on the number one seed in a gauntlet of a Western Conference. There's an argument there. Um, and I think that would have been less of one had even Denver just won one more game, been the unequivocal one seed, franchise record for wins, with all the stuff that's already true with Yoke. He might have been a unanimous MVP. He would have had a shot. It would have been really close. 
would have been really close. Um, and that's something that I predicted was going to happen maybe six weeks ago, uh, and it's going to come up just short. And I think that loss against San Antonio could have played a, a, a role in it. Um, all right, uh, Nuggets season as a whole. Guys, considering that this was the year coming off of a championship and years off of a championship in any sport or no, notorious for hangovers, all right, you've already been to the mountaintop. Do you have the same hunger? Do you have the same desire while while being the NBA's hunted? And both of those two things existing at the same time, it just depends on what t- type of team you are. You know, the initial fracture between Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant in the early 2000s, in the year 2000, they win their first championship, right? They had worked so hard to get there. They had been swept multiple times by the Utah Jazz, and they had fallen short. They finally get there. They beat um, Reggie Miller and the Indiana Pacers. And that they had a great team. Austin Crozier and, um, oh, my gosh, uh, Mark Jackson. And, um, oh, my God, what is his um, – Oh my God! I'm looking at him. The big, uh, um, day. Oh, not not Davis. Uh, or yes, it was. It was. It was one of the Davis brothers. Um, anyway, <laughs> going down my own rabbit hole here, like I'm entertaining myself and not on a podcast. Um, Shaq and Kobe's first fracture. They win the championship after so so uh, so much uh, failure, right? And the building up those scars that we talk about through the course of NBA history. Shaq comes back and says, I didn't touch a basketball. I did not touch a basketball since the finals. Says that out loud. Kobe says, I never left the gym. And they were just at different stages of their career. Shaq was maybe five years ahead of Kobe. And they just had totally different mindsets. That's, that's, that was their initial fracture. And I'm just bringing it up because they're, they're, those are two people on the same title team that just had different approaches. The Nuggets, after so much failure, get to the mountaintop. And they were the Kobe. As a team, they were the Kobe. The hunger never went away. The um, uh, competitive angst, it never, they never lost it. Uh, they embraced the target and had to raise their level to a further degree on a night-to-night basis to um, knock off those would-becomer uh, uh, you know, challengers. You know? And um, I just give them a huge tip of the hat. To, to win more games than you did before the year after winning a championship is remarkable. Oh, by the way, your second best player, your Robin, missed 20% of the season. You, you lost Bruce Brown. Now, it wasn't all like certain guys stepped up, Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, Reggie for the first portion of the season. Um, but I just I just think it's a testament to the group. I, I really do. That that is that is a rare type of um type of uh spirit within the team to win more games. And 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 have the one seed with two games left in the season, of the year after winning a title. I just I, I think it's fantastic, and give Michael Malone credit too for pushing the right buttons with this group. Um, Jokic had an A plus season, guys. What I'm going to do here on the very back stretch of the pod is just kind of give snapshot, uh, almost stream of consciousness thoughts on guys. I'm not going to do some big profile breakdown, but this is sort of the like end of the season report card and how. Um, without getting too much into the numbers and giving you more of my human, uh, like visceral reaction to what kind of season I thought these guys had. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go like one through eight here. Uh, Jokic A plus season, just spent a lot of time talking about him for MVP, just went through the numbers. He was sensational and he played 79 of the 82 games. This guy has been a model of consistency fr- from an availability standpoint that is not to be taken for granted. All right. Jamal Murray, uh, 21 points a game. I thought was was low key outside of the injuries. One of the best seasons that he has actually had as an NBA player. He had his uh, um, career highs in assists per game. All right, Jamal was a top fifteen assister in the NBA. Six and a half helpers every single night. That is um, that's freaking noteworthy, man. That's up like one point seven assists uh, uh, two years over two years. All right. Um, I think that's remarkable. Uh, a career high for Jamal in field goal percentage, 48% from the field. I think that's between that and his three point percentage, which is up to 42.5% from three. That's up 
almost three percentage points year over year. That's remarkable. You go back uh, four years ago in the 1920 season, he shot 35% from three, 34, six actually. And now that's up to 42 and a half percent. That is freaking amazing. So career high in assists per game, career high in field goal percentage, career high in three point percentage. And he accumulated the most blocks that he has ever had uh, in a single season, averaging a, a 0.7 per game. All right, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you go back and look at it, um, I mean, it was 37 blocks this season while missing 20% of it, so I thought that was noteworthy to pass along as well, and he scores 21.2 points per game, just the raw number. That ties his career high from two seasons ago when he uh, put up exactly that 21.2. So I thought this from a, uh, um, um, you know, looking at Jamal without the injury stuff, I thought he had a really good season. I'll give it a A minus. Consistency issues, no question. Injury issues, no question again. So he didn't do enough to put some of those like conversations about all star uh, in the rearview mirror. But those conversations are about to go to zero as the real race begins. So I thought all things considered, uh, the fifty nine games played, some of those career highs we just went over. Really good season for Jamal. Say a minus season. Uh, Michael Porter Jr. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to give Michael Porter Jr. an A minus season. And I know some of the consistency stuff. And when we react to game by game, he can drive you crazy sometimes. But when you're talking about averaging almost 17 points a game, making the most threes in any single season in the history of the Denver Nuggets, that is Michael Porter Jr. this year. And I thought he became a more well-rounded player this year. Um, you look at the way he was able to, you know, play a role within the team. This guy's not a star. He's 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 the 60th leading scorer in the NBA. But we know he's a vital player puzzle piece for Denver, and you look at the career-high seven rebounds, um, it, it was the third-highest scoring career of his uh, year of his career, so he didn't light the world on fire from a point-per-game standpoint, but got himself up to 40% shooting by the end of the season, 39.7, and, and a bunch of made threes, and the biggest thing with Michael Porter Jr., in addition to becoming a playing a better role and filling out the role, was the availability. 81 games played for Michael Porter Jr. That was the biggest question that, that, that this guy was facing in his career, and we don't even talk about it anymore, and that's a testament to him. Uh, Aaron Gordon, old hickory. When I say that, I mean just over-reliable, maybe the most underappreciated Denver athlete um, right now across the board, 14.7 rebounds, 3.5 assists per game. I thought AG was just steady Eddie. And we, we almost take him for granted uh, with just how consistent he is. I'll give him a, a B-plus season. Um, Reggie Jackson, it was a tale of two halves. I can't re remember how many times we came in here in the first 35 games of the season. Like, we were, we were planting flowers so they would grow and we could give them the Reggie. I mean, we couldn't praise him enough. Second half of the season, eh, it was hard to watch. Um, I think he's going to be fine. The way that I've uh, summarized uh, the, the the bench's role in the playoffs is I'm not worried about it. I've talked about this for a couple weeks, and the word I've used is narrowed. The minutes are going to be narrowed. The focus is going to be narrowed. You're going to be playing with starters. You're not going to be doing the heavy lifting of the regular season, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's nights that we come in here talking about Reggie Jackson being a vital role in uh, having a vital role in a uh, in a Nuggets playoff win because of his shot making and experience and his trust level still with my uh, with Michael Malone, and then finally to round out the group, um, I mean KCP one of the uh, starters left over, um, you know was great. I thought I mean it's an A minus season for KCP. Um, I think he's going to end up on a, a all defensive team. I don't believe it's going to be first team the way that Nuggets Nation wants, but I do think he'll he'll get there. Um, again, he's kind of like Aaron Gordon in Mr. Steady Eddie. Double digits uh, ev almost every single night. One of the best three-point shooters um, that the league is going to have uh, and one of the best uh, just overall well-rounded players that we're going to have in the playoffs. And then uh, then uh, Christian Brown and Peyton Watson, man. Uh, double trouble, as my co-host Phil uh, Lindsay calls them uh, on the drive on the fan. Um, it was it, month by month imperfect, right? Young basketball players. One playing in his second season, the other playing playing in his first season as an everyday player in Peyton Watson. And you took the good with the bad. And then you take a look at the overall snapshot of the season. I thought awesome. 
I, you know, Christian Brown ended up getting his uh, three point percentage where you hoped it would be before the season began, um, inching his way all the way up to you know thirty nine percent from three. I thought that is a huge benchmark for him. Um, and uh, well, I said 39, 38, 38 and a half uh, percent from three. Um, and at, w- went from averaging 4.7 points a game to 7.3 points a game. That's a big year over year jump uh, when he was asked to do more going from 16 minutes to 20 minutes. And he played in every damn game this season. And that's just something that you can't put a value on. And Peyton Watson, it was night by night. It was month by month. Um, but this guy's upside I think he's got a chance to be a $100 million player in a couple of years and, and 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 play a vital role defensively in a title run. I'll give him, considering what the expectations were coming in, that's an A-minus season, I thought, for, for Peyton Watson. Very imperfect, but through the lens of expectation and results, really, you got to love what you saw this year from young Peyton Watson. Um, guys, we're going to leave it there for now. We've already run a little bit long. I uh, thank you for being here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe, turn the alerts on, all right, leave a comment, hit me up on all socials, Twitter, uh, uh, YouTube, Instagram, at ZBuy23. Um, thank you for a great uh, season. We'll continue looking ahead uh, to the postseason when we come in here on Thursday and react to Lakers, Pelicans. We'll know the matchup and we'll forecast what to expect in that first round series. And whatever happens on Tuesday night, against the Pelicans and the Lakers. You already know we'll be back here on Thursday talking about it on the Mile High Hoops podcast.